Yeah, I'm watch. I'm watching the list. More and more people are joining. We're a couple minutes past noon. I say we go ahead and get started. Oh, we go ahead and we advance. Well, one, let's advance to the next PowerPoint slide. We'll set us up. But two, as more and more people are joining, if you want to hit the chat box, say hi. If you want to introduce yourself, if you want to share your organization, uh, feel free. This is going to be a, a, a fun session today, uh, an impactful session. So excited to be here. So how about an introduction? My name is Eric Van Duren. I work as the Senior Director of Talent Acquisition for Spectrum Health. Uh, in addition to that, I serve as one of the leaders on uh, the Talent 2025 HR Council. So on your on your screen today, you know you can see I, most of us are probably familiar or very familiar with Talent 2025, the mission, the vision. Uh, but kind of something cool and, and something new that's coming forward is this Spotlight series. So these Spotlight series are really just intended to bring HR professionals uh, together, professionals together dive, you know, deep dive into a single topic and just have some really robust discussion where maybe it leads to self-reflection or maybe it leads to the things you can bring back to your organizations uh, and help just in the work uh, that each of you is driving forward. So we are starting off with the topic of mental health uh, for this first Spotlight series. Why? I mean, so for so many reasons. I mean, you can see it on the screen, safety, wellness, uh, productivity in or, of an organization. But really, you know, this is just something that that encompasses is everyone and is just a, such a powerful thing that can make a difference in someone's life, but also in an organizational performance and in so many different levels. So how is today going to work? I'm going to run through a PowerPoint presentation going to have your chat box. We will have time for question and answer. So I very much recommend, you know, putting questions in the chat. We are going to leave people on mute. We'll bring those questions forward. So either go just pop them in. If you have an anonymous question, feel free to, to message me directly. So again, that's Eric Van Duren. And when we kind of hit some some breaks in this presentation, we can go ahead and bring those those questions forward. You know, what are you up against in your organizations? What questions do you have for for experts today. Um, so looking forward to that. You'll see after this, you know, as far as logistics, the presentation, the resources, a survey will all be sent afterwards. Um, and then kind of my role is, is, is here for as facilitator today. So I want to turn it over and I want to, to introduce our guest speakers, both from Hope, Hope Network. Um, so I think first off, we're going to have Dr. Kieran Taylor kick us off, Hope Network, uh, the Chief Medical Officer. But then also followed by, by Megan Zambiasi, Senior Executive Vice President of Operations and Strategy for Hope Network. I've seen the presentation. I'm excited for it today. And I think you'll each you will get a lot of value. So, so with that, I'm going to pause and I'm going to turn it over to, to Dr. Taylor. Thank you for the invitation, Eric. Megan and I are glad to be here and share information with everyone and hope uh, you all walk away with some tips and tricks. So let's dive in. Uh, briefly, the agenda, I'm gonna cover why. Uh, Eric also mentioned some reasons, but why is mental health so important uh, to keep track of in our employees and to help support them in their mental health? What are some strategies to address mental health at work? And Megan will dive into some of that and we'll have our discussion topics and case scenarios. And then we'll end with a summary of resources for you all to, to take home with, with you. All right, so the why. Well, we know mental health and workplace stress are interconnected and impact one another. In a survey that was done earlier this year, 5,000 employees in various industries in the US, we, uh, it was discovered that 83% of employees feel emotionally drained from their work. 25% of employees experience severe burnout, and most employees, 59%, say they do not get emotional support from their supervisor, which is a demonstrated component of a safe and healthy workplace. Next slide. So this survey was conducted by Mental Health America, which is an organization over 100 years old, dedicated to promoting mental health and preventing mental illness. And as I mentioned, it was a survey of 5,000 employees across 17 different industries. So here's a slide. I thought 
with the diversity of our audience today, this would be a good slide to show that mental health and how it impacts our employees is evident in every industry. And there are certain industries that are more successful in promoting and optimizing the mental health of employees and other industries for whatever the reasons are where we tend to see uh, more significant concerns for mental health in our employees. Next slide. So there is a direct cost if mental health in our employees is not, can, is not optimized. So it behooves us as HR um, staff and leaders of our companies to look into this. First of all, there's a direct cost to our companies in terms of it is well documented that employees with mental illness incur higher healthcare costs than employees without mental illness. And what's important here is that that's regardless of the physical health status. So if you look at the next slide, this is a chart, a pie chart that describes the incremental annual healthcare cost for employed persons with major depression versus those not having a diagnosis of major depression. So on average, employees with a diagnosis of major depression incur over $6,000, so that would be the sum of all the pie pieces here, in healthcare expenditures than those without a diagnosis of major depression. And so this uh, dark blue category that represents almost 40% of that higher cost is medical cost. So I think it's the point I'm trying to drive home here is that it's not just the mental health or the costs of treating mental illness, it's also the costs in physical health go up and uh, the overall total cost of care goes up for an individual when mental health concerns are present. Next slide. There are some indirect costs to employers uh, when there's mental illness in the workplace. Absenteeism is one of them. And we know from studies that employees with major depression, for example, miss between six to 26 more days of work than employees without a diagnosis of major depression. We also know that employees with mental illness in general also claim more short-term disability days than employees without mental illness. And this next slide here, SPAR graph, the, the blue, the dark blue is um, a, a control group. And so on average, that's without any diagnosis of mental illness, 50 short-term disability days in, in this study um, was, was the average that were utilized uh, annually. And this uh, tallest bar in the middle is uh, the group of individuals that have a diagnosis of depression. Uh, so you can see 72 days versus the control group of 50 days. And then the third bar uh, at the right is 65 days. And that's, those are folks with um, depression in their diagnosis, but they have other diagnoses as well, physical uh, ailments uh, and other types of uh, diagnoses. Um, so there you have depression as the primary diagnosis has the highest number of short-term disability days. Presenteeism is also becomes an issue when our employees are dealing with mental health concerns. So what does that mean? That means you're there at work, you're not absent as in the previous slide, but you're there and you're not uh, performing optimally. So what does that look like? There could be poor performance in time management abilities, um, working at the required pace, ability to perform physical work tasks, concentration error rates, uh, your overall work output. So we know that employees with mental health issues experience a greater impact on their work than employees um, otherwise without mental health issues or even with just physical health issues. Next slide. Turnover is another indirect cost. Uh, employees with mental illness tend to leave their jobs at higher rates and than those without mental illness up to a 10% difference. And employees who feel, we do know too from these studies that employees who feel acknowledged at work are less uh, acknowledged for um, what they're going through and supported in some way are less likely to seek out other employment opportunities. And so later in this talk, when we talk, uh, mention strategies, that becomes an important component in what um, businesses can do to help their employees. Next slide. 
So COVID-19, something that we all have been dealing with um, first time in our lifetime, and of course, tremendous impact on the mental health of our employees and all of us. So what does that look like? How? How is there an impact on our mental health? Increased workload, whether companies right sizing, so there's more responsibilities on individuals, or people feel like they need to produce more. Uh, there's an sense of increased workload often right now. Uh, economic insecurity. Am I going to keep my job? Companies are changing. As of August 2020, one in four employees who were screened for at least moderate anxiety or depression cited financial problems as one of the primary factors. This is a key component that um, the pandemic has triggered for many of us. Increased stress due to our work environment. Well, our, uh, our environments have changed, whether we have to apply increased precautions around personal protective equipment, you know, masks and physical distancing and, and cleaning practices, or whether we've shift to remote work, uh, our environments are different. And at home, or um, the boundary between work and home can be blurred, and that can be mentally taxing uh, in a new way for many people. Uh, it can be increased stress due to reduced support of resources, child care, child care, excuse me, schooling. Kids are now at home. We're sharing space at home um, more than ever before. Next slide. So these statistics are from a study of 12,000 employees, managers, HR leaders like yourself, and exec, uh, executives across 11 different countries. And this data was gathered last summer, so post-pandemic, uh, the start of the pandemic, I should say. And as you can see here, 70% of people have more stress and anxiety than any other previous year. 85% are saying their mental health issues at work negatively affect their home life. And 76% of people believe companies should be doing more to support the mental health of their workforce. So this really summarizes um, you know, the purpose of our topic today. I'm really glad Talent 2025 uh, chose this as a spotlight uh, series. It impacts us all. So I'll end there with data, um, kind of the, the, you know, setting the background and, and the landscape and why this is an important topic. Are there any questions? Whitney did share in the chat, uh, kind of similar. So keep them coming in the chat if you do have those questions. Again, you can email or direct message me if you want to be anonymous. But but Dr. Taylor, just some of those stats, I mean, just surprisingly high to me. So so one, I appreciate the background. And I know myself, uh, I've fallen in those buckets personally, but then also carry the stress of knowing that others are in there and how do you help and support in the impact, not only work, but home environment. So just well. Right, no, thank, thank you for sharing, Eric. And that's why we'd like to launch into a poll. So when you think about your own workplaces, which mental health concerns, and there'll be a pop-up box on your screen here shortly, which mental health concerns would you say are affecting your employees right now? And there should be a choice of four, and you can select more than one. We kind of want to survey the audience and see what you all are experiencing from your perspectives in your companies. The poll has been launched. We have about 14 respondents who've completed it so far. We'll just allow a few more seconds and then I'll share the results with the group. There are three people on the call who have not completed the poll yet. I'll give you a few seconds in case those <laughs> remaining three attendees would like to complete the poll. All right, I will close out the poll and share the results. Thank you, Whitney. My pleasure. So this audience feels like um, 
60% of you responded that feeling isolated or a lack of connection to emotional support is a mental health concern that's affecting your employees right now. 45%, now keep in mind more than one answer could be selected. 45% uh, believe distraction or inability to concentrate on work is an issue. A quarter of you uh, feel like worry about finances, job stability is an issue, and then changes in demeanor or unusual behavior uh, at 15%, which is still one in six to seven people, right? So as you can see, none of you are alone in experiencing these things, either yourselves or in your companies. And together today, as we continue to discuss strategies on how to address some of these mental health concerns, uh, I'm hopeful that we can engage in fruitful discussion. And again, that you all can walk away feeling uh, more supported to then in turn help support your companies. So with that, we'll launch into some strategies to address mental health at work. And before I hand it over to Megan, I just want to um, talk about one key component as a strategy. So as you um, just saw that we, um, you know, summarized or had a, the poll with some common factors that may be impacting the mental health of your employees. If you want to further assess perhaps how your employees are experiencing um, their lives right now, their time at work. There are some tools on the screen. And when we have our virtual resource handout at the end um, that you all will see, these resources will be on there and links to them. But this is an example I wanna highlight and I won't go into detail just due to time, um, but could be very useful to helping you to further understand maybe where do you wanna target resources? because uh, every industry, as we saw in an earlier slide, may do some things better than others in terms of supporting their employees. So with that, I will pass the baton over to Megan. Great, thank you everyone. And thank you, Dr. Taylor, for all of that. Um, I'm gonna give some practical tips and whatnot that uh, hopefully you can use and take back to your workplaces. So, um, you know, one of the things I know most of you already have are in employee assistance programs, and these have been around for a while, um, and most of your employees know, of course, that uh, you do have them. You probably put all sorts of things out there reminding them about that, and hopefully some of them have taken advantage of it. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I wanted to mention about this is that this is one of the, it, it is um, something you have to kind of keep up with. Um, just saying it once um, sometimes doesn't really get across to people or they forget that that's a benefit they have until they really need it. So the more that you can repeat yourself about around this, even though you'll probably feel like a broken record, um, it really is going to be better for that, uh, for your folks. They'll feel safer uh, for sure. Next slide, thank you. Um, in terms of ways to promote those employee assistance programs, there are a few different ways that you can manage that. One is really very clear and consistent messaging. So if you have a newsletter or other ways that you communicate with your employees, being sure to have like a little snippet in there about that, reminding them that that's available. Also, if there is, um, you know, for instance, somebody in your team loses somebody, um, there is a um, tragedy that takes place in your somebody's family. Um, having a pretty consistent message to your management, um, to your managerial teams who have those employees and reminding them to, to use EAP during those times can be very helpful as well. Because that, again, uh, we don't always think about that as, oh yeah, we have somebody who can be helpful here. Um, highlighting our, or giving scenarios, and you'll see in a couple minutes here, we're going to do some scenarios and give you some examples of that. But you can give anonymous brief scenarios to folks, um, and that could be another great thing to put out in a newsletter or to mention. Um, people often connect to stories, um, so a story of how this might be helpful um, could be really um, you know, engaging for your employees and help, help them remember to take advantage of this um, as well. And last but not least, definitely, is to emphasize the confidentiality. This is the number one concern, actually, that most employees have around using EAPs. Um, even though uh, these are protected and there really isn't a good way for you to know exactly who asked what um, of the EAP, um, your employees need to hear that specifically from you on it consistently, which is really, this is a gift to you. Um, we want you to take advantage of this. This is confidential. We won't know about that. Um, very helpful to be really transparent about that. 
promoting wellness. Um, you know, this is another one. I've seen a lot of employers do this actually um, during uh, the pandemic, which has been fantastic, um, is really spending some time on this, particularly around mental health, because as Dr. Taylor noted earlier, there, there's been um, you know, so much more difficulty around that than there had been previously. So um, include mental health topics, just like you would other kinds of things. So when you're talking about how to improve uh, your exercise habits or whatnot, also include ways to include um, improve your mental health. Um, so mindfulness, resilience, um, suicide prevention, um, caregiving, all these stressors that are very, uh, very common for folks um, to encounter in their daily lives. It's great to be able to include those right alongside any other more medical uh, wellness at activities that you may be highlighting. Um, the next really is around just providing some assistance to your managers, um, because I think sometimes managers are not really very quite clear on what can they do to make it easier for their employees. Um, they probably don't know for themselves all the time, much less know how to do that for others. So if you do have easy things that you can adapt in your work environment, time to be flexible, especially right now um, around employee needs. Um, I think, you know, the best example I can think of is we have a lot of um, parents who are trying to adapt to online schooling or, um, or the hybrid schooling, and they've needed some accommodations to be able to do their work in the, in the best way possible. Um, you know, be sure that you mention that and that you encourage your managers to do that as much as possible in balancing the workloads, helping with scheduling, other kinds of things that might be minor, um, really, in terms of getting the work done, but may really be helpful to your employees. The last one, um, and this one is actually about um, time off. So paid time off that, um, you know, is probably a big part of your benefit package. Um, communicating frequently about that. A lot of people have actually not taken their time off um, during the pandemic. Uh, you know, I'm, I know I'm guilty of this as well, which is, you know, uh, I'm not going on my usual vacations. And so if I'm not going on my usual vacations, maybe I'll just store up the time and not take that time. Being sure to encourage people that even if you can't really go much of anywhere or you're choosing not to go much of anywhere, still that time away is really necessary for you to refresh. Um, and reminding them of the organizational policies that are there um, and also encouraging people in those policies to use their time um, as much as possible. Um, and also the, the supervisors, the managers and people in leadership should be setting examples in this way and making it clear, I'm taking my time off, I'm taking time away. I have boundaries around my work time. I'm doing it because I want you to do it. That's really meaningful to employees when they see that model for them. That gives them permission effectively um, to do that. Um, facilitating connection and relationship building. So, you know, positive meeting cultures, harder to do, obviously, when everything is over Zoom, but we do our best. Um, but, you know, so try, trying to just engage people. Um, that small talk that probably everyone did as they were walking into the meeting room, trying to have a couple minutes of that maybe at the beginning of a meeting is helpful. Um, you know, having things available for people on wellness topics or coping strategies, sharing stressors, anything that kind of helps you um, engage with other people. And then I like this, uh, the newsletter and with the personal tidbits piece, these are really kind of funny. Um, I My personal favorite is uh, uh, Two Truths and a Lie. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen that, but it's hilarious um, and always kind of fun. So, <laughs> you know, there are lots of things that are really small like that, but really help make people laugh and help them um, connect to each other and get to know each other a little better when they're not in the same space. If you are back at work or you have a hybrid um, situation, um, you know, thinking about physical spaces at work for wellness activities. So, you know, I know around our office, we have a really nice walking um, area. So especially when the weather's nice, it's, it's great to just get even five minutes outside and take a little stroll. Um, but whatever it is that you might have available to you, encourage that and maybe convert, uh, you know, a space for people to have these kinds of things available for them right now. And last, you know, share that information about mental health and emotional support resources right alongside every other wellness thing that you do, because um, giving it credence, um, again, gives people permission um, to take, you know, see that as being important. Uh, talking about mental health, you know, this is always interesting because, um, you know, most employees, when they're pulled, they're going to talk about how they really actually don't think that their supervisor is very emotionally supportive. And you may think, um, you know, well, it's work. Um, I really don't want to delve into my employee's business to that degree. I shouldn't. I know we have HR leaders on this call, so we need to be careful with that. Um, but at the same time, um, being able to feel like it's a supportive environment can be very meaningful to employees when they're really having a difficult time. Um, so um, it's a matter of having that good boundary, but also opening up the space so people feel comfortable saying if they need help or support. Um, so, you know, broaching that topic if they need it. So, um, you know, examples are if, you know, if they can't talk to, to you about their job stressors, 
um, especially if they um, are coping with a mental illness like anxiety or depression, for instance, that may make it more difficult for them to do their work effectively. So you want them to be able to say, hey, I need more breaks than that in my day. Um, you know, I really, I need some downtime to process or take a walk. That's, that really would be, um, you can emphasize that when you're talking with people. Um, and also I think, you know, helping your manager, your managers, your leaders in general, think about what they should be able to do pretty easily. A simple check-in. So in at the beginning of a meeting, doing a quick round table around like, how are you doing? Like, how are you really doing? <laughs> is a really good question to ask. Um, you know, offering emotional support if you do see somebody who's stressed out. Um, you know, you're not going to cause stress by asking somebody if they're okay and, um, you know, in a caring way that's really, it's helpful. People perceive that um, often as being really, you know, a kind thing to do. Um, offering resources, and we'll talk about that in a few more minutes, but it also helps them feel more acknowledged, accepted, um, and like the, this environment is a good one for them, um, despite all of the other things going on in their life. And this is just a little, um, you know, graphic here that just kind of shows you about, um, you know, managers and they're thinking about mental health concerns in employees. So on the left here, um, the percentage of managers who believe it's part of their job to inter intervene. So actually, most of us um, in leadership think, yeah, I probably should be doing something. <laughs> um, but you can notice that it goes down um, in terms of um, people who actually have intervened. Um, so there's a gap there between, you know, have I actually done it? Um, you know, I know I should. I just... I, I didn't know how probably, because if you look at the last one, they're like, I'm not trained. <laughs> Nobody ever told me how to do this. So um, that is something to be, to keep in mind here is that we probably need to deliberately give talking points or help people through um, how to respond to mental health concerns so that it becomes a more comfortable thing for everyone. So here are just a few tips and tricks. Um, you know, I think again, that thing that I said earlier about checking in regularly, I mean, and this is just sort of a, a routine thing, very easy to do, making that part of your, your um, culture and um, whatnot is, could be really important, really. Um, you know, I think that bi-directional feedback, so not only asking them, but asking them, you know, do you know, uh, am I, you know, is it, are you okay? You know, um, do I seem okay? You know, is all this stuff going on in the background during our meetings? Is that bothering you? <laughs> um, you know, all of that. I know at any given point, sometimes we have, you know, babies crying and dogs barking during some of our meetings. I'm sure all of you probably have things like that too, if you're um, remote. Um, but helping people to understand that back and forth and that it's not just them, it's you as well. Acknowledging efforts. So if you see people um, doing a good job reaching out to others or or if they're really doing a good job around taking care of themselves, um, you know, call that out and thank people for doing that and being a good, um, you know, good example or model for others. Um, and last, if, you know, employees really start to have mental health concerns, um, you know, this has gone on pre-pandemic, definitely, but these are some of the things I think that people struggle most with. You can always reach out and ask, you know, those of us in the behavioral health field for help and support. We're happy to do that. But really basic stuff, like just asking open-ended questions, you know, this, you know, how are you doing? Or, um, you know, or I noticed you've been struggling a little bit lately. Are you okay? Um, that kind of thing can be very, um, very helpful and supportive. And even if they don't want to tell you the whole thing, at least, um, you know, gives that, uh, you know, the sense that you care and that you're wanting to engage with them. If they do start to share, just really listen, um, you know, take some time, close the door, let them tell you what's going on, um, you know, and so if they want to talk to you, you know, just have complete attention there. So um, knowing that. And the other piece is just that, you know, the act of listening is recognizing their feelings, understanding you don't have to fix anything. Um, I think a lot of times people wonder, you know, well, if they start telling me, what do I do? Really just listen, um, you know, and tell them you're, you're hearing them, you want to be supportive. That's really all you'll need to do here. And then also then direct them to the EAP or other resources, which we're going to share with you here. So, you know, no one expects you to be the counselor or to do that job. Um, but knowing that somebody listened to them is going to be able to provide them maybe with some resources that can be really helpful to people. Questions. I've seen a lot of chat activity, which is good. I, I can help catch up there. So a lot of good. So one, wow, just a ton of good information. One of the first questions that uh, popped in the chat, Megan, was just around communication channels for, for sharing information around EAPs. Um, mm -hmm. There was some some other feedback down below of, of recommendations, posters, email, newsletters. Um, mm -hmm. Any other recommendations on, on communication avenues or approaches or strategies for, for EAP? Yeah, I really think, I mean, I think all of those things, you guys have all the basics down for sure. Um, 
the direct communication. So if you could get your, your rank and file managers, especially to talk about this during meetings that they may have or check in times. Um, I think that could be very helpful because most people, you know, are most they're most closely connected to the people in their orbit. So getting that to be a routine part of your culture that, you know, people say, hey, remember, we've got the EAP here, please use any of that, um, you know, can be, it just normalizes that and probably like increases the likelihood that your employees will engage with it. I, I loved your your line or feedback of, of this is a gift, you know, this, this is such a powerful thing. Um, mm -hmm. I just re I really like that as well. So. <laughs> one of the direct messages that came in were, you know, a number of organizations have employee affinity groups or inclusion groups or employee <laughs> resource groups. Have you seen a trend or any thoughts or recommendations on like a mental health focus group or any thoughts mm -hmm. or perspective on, on that within organizations? Yeah, you know, actually, I went to a conference um, a few months ago. It was actually an in-person conference, believe it or not, a small, small one. But um, there was a fascinating um, idea there that was a um, was a wellness channel that an organization had started, and they um, they had people kind of come on and engage more actively with employees in this way. Um, so they did various things. They did yoga. They did you know, they, they did all sorts of activities. But they they also started a very robust conversation. So they ended up having um, some op online support groups and other kinds of ways for their employees to engage. And eventually, they actually opened it up to more of the community. Uh, their community loved it so much that they wanted more of it. So they had um, some active I mean, other employers um, also get on board and use the same channel. So it was a great idea. I thought it was brilliant. Awesome. And as I'm reading the chat here, just getting employees to open up, framing questions. How are you really? really you know just making yeah. it kind of a safe place <laughs> yeah. yeah uh w whitney had one here that i think is great of uh, i think the essentially building trust so mm -hmm. allowing employees to open up without fear of potential you know retaliation or when we're talking right. in a performance review or opportunity for projects or tying mm -hmm. i shared something here that is now impacting me over here so i guess mm -hmm. any recommendations for HR professionals as they navigate that throughout their organizations? Yeah, you know, those are those are the, the more difficult things is first of all, you know, building that trust is very important. And that's why I always like to when possible say, you know, the man, the managers actually hold the key in most of this, the people that are the closest to your employees are often going to be the most effective just because they know them and they interact with them the most often. Um, so, you know, I would definitely go there. Um, you know, I think the other parts of the engagement are just going to be around um, making sure to, um, you know, if there are things that are more complex or you notice that that might be tied to work performance in some way, is being careful to kind of separate that out, um, you know, and I often would, would be one to say, okay, you know, I'm listening to you, I hear you, I can give you these resources, and then I'm going to let maybe my HR department or somebody else who's more neutral, you know, who isn't going to be involved in that help with the handoff there so that if there is a performance of peace that we can talk about that separately. But if, I would encourage, and we'll talk about this in a moment to any accommodation you feel you can reasonably make. Um, sometimes, especially if it's a relatively short-term kind of thing, somebody is experiencing grief and loss episode, for instance, or they have something that's more temporary. A lot of times, small accommodations in their schedule or help catching up, people remember that. They really, really um, engaged with the idea that somebody came to my aid and helped me when I asked for it. Um, and if you're able to do that, especially with somebody that you've known for quite a while, I mean, you, you will have an employee for life. Um, this is in the time when you're really wanting to most, most hold on to your employees. I know that's something we always think about. Um, that is really meaningful to people right now. So, so powerful, it just the, the meaningful, mm -hmm. the authenticity, the, mm -hmm. it's great. So I think we're caught up on questions. So thank you very great. much. Great. Okay, next slide. So here are just some, some scenarios. Uh, you know, as you can tell, we like to tell stories and I think that's the best way to connect with people. So next slide. Um, so we're going to give you these and then we're going to have you fill out one of these, um, you know, polls here so we can talk about them a little bit. So the first workplace scenario. Um, this employee has been struggling to keep up with their job duties. They disclose they're having trouble juggling family commitments and work time. Um, so here are the four different um, you know, answers, um, and we'll let you go ahead and do that next.
All right, here they come. <laughs> I'm going to even fill mine out. All right, Whitney, you'll let us know when they're ready. Of course, the poll has been launched. We have 13 responses so far. So I'll Great. see if we can get our responses to match our number of attendees, and then I will share the results. Give it a few more seconds. 18 responses so far. 19. All right, I am going to end the poll and share the results. Great. Wow, you guys are so smart. <laughs> the answer is D, all of the above. Um, obviously, depending on what you have to offer, but um, whenever possible, um, you know, if you can do um, any or all of these, these are all great ideas um, to help people cope um, as they are struggling. This is something that's been so common with people during COVID for sure. All right, next slide. All right, so this is our second scenario. Um, and I, one that rings home, you know, true for me for sure, uh, with people uh, thinking about returning back to work and probably with many of you as well. So the company is starting to look at uh, revisiting their return to work plan. Uh, and several key employees have noted they feel uncomfortable returning to the workplace. How would you address their concerns? Um, so A, a personal conversation with the employee about their concerns. B, provide organizational response and clear communication on return to work. C, allow variations of return to work in work schedules or patterns, or D, all of the above. And here is your poll. Have about 16 responses submitted so far. Okay. okay. Give it a few more seconds. All right, I am going to close the poll and share the results. Great. Ah, boy, you guys are blowing me out of the water here. This is great. Yes, all of the above um, is exactly the right response here. You know, and I think that um, some of these are just different levels of conversation depending on what people um, need. So in a way you kind of need to do all three. Um, if you have somebody who's especially anxious in particular, um, you know, someone should have a personal conversation and try to figure out what's happening there and what, what we might be able to do. I think the, uh, the roadmap piece, so number two, that organizational response is also really helpful in paving the way and having people understand the expectation. It's tough when the marker keeps moving. I know when the latest Myosha piece came out again about, okay, not until October, you know, we found ourselves dialing back a little bit and trying to re rework it. But people understand that. I think they appreciate, especially if they're trying to organize the other parts of their life, that you're, you've got some attempt there and you're trying to give them the information and, and plan out. Um, and if you can, if you can do asynchronous work or if you can allow any kinds of variations for people, some people might be a lot more comfortable than others. Any of those things, um, you know, just help us all kind of get to the same place. Um, another one that isn't on here that I would add is a um, positive attitude about being back together. So if your your intent is to bring everybody back together, start talking about all the benefits of being in the same place and how much you miss people. And that's meaningful too. All right, next slide. All right, um, and this one is about um, alcohol use um, or substance use. So it comes to your attention that one of your employees has been suspected of abusing alcohol and has been observed slurring their words, interrupting people talking and making inappropriate comments in Zoom meetings. All right, so the, for this, we've got um, you know four choices of things. So if you wanna just read those over and Whitney, I'll let you bring up the poll here. I've received 11 responses so far. I'll give it a few minutes. This one's a little harder. Exactly, <laughs> doesn't have to be an easy answer. <laughs> I'll be above. 
Give it another few seconds. We're at 17 responses submitted so far. All right, I will end the polling and share the results. All right. Yes, this one is harder. And, you know, no, um, other than number two, which I'm glad to see 0% said that, <laughs> um, it, they're really, um, you know, there aren't wrong answers necessarily. Um, but the two that you both have, you know, both people marked are probably both excellent. First, though, the first intervention I would recommend is actually that one-to-one -one conversation. And some of this is just about the behavioral health um, portion of someone is much more likely to respond positively if someone has a gentle conversation with them to begin with expressing concern about what they saw. So, you know, it would be, uh, you know, John, I noticed, um, you know, in our last Zoom meeting that it seemed, you know, you seem different. And a few other people mentioned that too, you know. Um, so I'm wondering how you're doing. <laughs> Open-ended questions, um, noting the behavior, um, you know, saying, you know, your your speech was slurred. You appeared intoxicated. Is there anything we can do to help? That kind of thing. Um, so making that not punitive, gentle inquiring, and starting from there can also be. It just can be very helpful and powerful. All right. Thank you. Next slide. Discussion, any questions at all? So we did have a, a few more pop in um, and I love what's happening here. So a question will pop in the chat. We'll get some feedback from others. Mm -hmm. So I really encourage that to happen. But, but the question that just came in was about paid time off. And I think this mm -hmm. hits on people are balancing stress. They're balancing home environment. They're balancing, should I take PTO? Do I have PTO yeah. guilt? When do I do it? So really noticing people are are, are taking PTO or are maybe not utilizing it as they should. Is there mm -hmm. ways to incentivize it or or, or, or how yeah. do we how do we make that just more more reasonable for someone to do and, and be able to, yeah. to take the time away? You know, this is this is a really difficult one because you know people right now actually feel guilty, right, for taking time off. I've heard a lot of that, um, even from my own teams, about you know I'd love to take some time away, but then I'm worried because you know other people are going to have to cover me, and it's harder right now to do that. Um, so I think we have to. This is where I think that modeling comes in and is so important. Is um, you know you are leaders almost need to step into this space and say we mean it, you guys have to take some time off, <laughs> you know, like we all need a break. And, um, you know, so we're gonna arrange for coverage. Um, so I have seen some places actually mandate time off, um, especially if you're in a spike, like in healthcare, if you're in a, in a spike, um, many places will actually mandate some time away for, for their critical staff because we need their resources. We need, to, we need them to be well. So we're like, we actually, no, you're not coming into work this week. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, we don't necessarily even mandate the PTO. We just give them time away, especially if they've been working a lot of time. So um, I think that kind of example or really encouraging and saying, no, we're all going to take at least a week of vacation, myself included, and I'm going to set up a coverage schedule. And I promise when you go, I'm going to cover your stuff. To hear that, I think can may help people feel like they're lifted from that burden. And no, I don't want you to answer your cell phone with a ranks or no email messages, <laughs> all those kinds of things can be really helpful. It's hard to do. I, I think that's that's such a good call. Uh, we've we've all had the the boss that leaves on PTO. Are they really on PTO? Because I'm getting more yes. messages than I normally do. But then yes. I look at myself. I'm like, have I done that? Not been a good right. model to others. Yeah. Right. So. Right. Right. I'm, I'm guilty as charged. Um, and I've had people. You know, my employees call me out on it previously, and and I that helped me reform my behavior. Um, because I I want them to get time away. So if we're serious about it, you need to do it yourself. All right, great. Any others there? Are we all set? I think all set. Okay, perfect. All right, next slide. All right, these are just some resources and I'll do a, just a real quick overview of them because uh, we prepared a really nice um, you know, set of uh, things for you to take back with you. This here though, I think might be useful. I um, This comes actually from some of my previous experience where I used to, I was, had a job where I got a lot of calls actually from HR leaders um, who would say, I've got somebody in crisis, I don't know what to do. Um, and we would kind of run through, these are the different kinds of, these are the levels of care for behavioral health. So I thought you might benefit from seeing it and you can use this as a resource for yourself about 
if this is going on, this is probably where it needs to go. <laughs> okay, so that's what this is meant as. It's a nice little, it's a cheat sheet, crosswalk, whatever you want it to be. Feel free to distribute this however you'd like. Um, but this is just an educational piece here. So as you can see, it goes all the way from extreme agitation or somebody is um, you know, uh, openly psychotic or delusional um, or whatnot, then they need to go to the emergency department. Okay. Um, or if they're so intoxicated, they can't function. You're going to need to send them there all the way down to outpatient treatment. You have somebody who's in your office and is crying and is really struggling um, and um, they need some help, but um, you know, and they're willing to go to treatment, then really helping connect them with your EAP or other resources really would be reasonable. Right. And so this is another brochure, again, that you will get, but this gives you um, some mental health crisis uh, resource guides. Um, this is Kent County, um, specifically for, for those of you who are in different counties. Um, certainly, um, a lot of these actually cross over county lines, just so you know that. Um, so it still would be helpful to you, but your own county may have some more. Um, but this really kind of helps you walk through very similar kinds of things, which is, you know, if you need something, especially if you're getting into the insurances, so you'll notice in the inside here, it talks about if you have people with different kinds of insurances, that there are different lanes for them. And that's super, it's very complicated, but a brochure like this could be really helpful um, for you and probably for your staff if you end up in that spot. And um, just in a nutshell, this is your resource list that's going to be um, in the in that follow up email. And these are nice little links you can click on, take you right to the places you need to go. I would highly recommend you save that someplace. Again, these are meant to be shared. Feel free to send these out to all your managers. Um, one of the things I think that Dr. Taylor and I would love to see, um, because this um, overall in our communities helps us prevent um, you know, important problems, is if the people on the front lines have access to these things. So you know where to click and where to go. Um, it will make it so much easier. It cuts out a lot of that, um, that time when people are looking for something because that's the most frustrating thing for somebody who's in crisis and ready to get help. All right. So telehealth, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about telehealth. Uh, there's a lot more of that going on right now. And actually a lot of folks find that to be really helpful. Uh, many people who previously may have hesitated to go to counseling because they didn't wanna be seen in a waiting room, for instance, um, it, there just isn't as much stigma when you're at home. Uh, so, or in your car, uh, a lot of people um, you know, will go park at a park. Um, we don't recommend, by the way, doing counseling while you're driving, but, you know, <laughs> but certainly, you know, um, you can access telehealth in a lot of different places. So I really wanted to be sure to um, highlight that, that there are definitely those things out there. Please uh, encourage your employees to take advantage of those. Those could be very convenient. Um, there are mental health apps too. Um, a lot of our, our folks um, who are um, a little on the younger side, so maybe some of our Gen Z or millennial um, employees, um, love to try things in apps. Um, first, because it's their, you know, they're digital natives and they're very comfortable with that. So these are some great ones to start with, um, you know, you know, Talkspace has, um, you know, just an all online platform. Everything's right there. Headspace is a really neat one. Calm is another one that isn't on here, but it gives meditation and other kinds of, you know, leading people through um, calming exercises. And then this last one, Mood Mission, is actually cognitive behavioral therapy, and it gives some um, skill building kinds of activities that people can complete on their own. All right. Any final questions at all? We do have a couple minutes. So again, if we do have more questions, uh, please hit the chat either to everyone or, or to me directly. But wow, I mean, just, just getting these resources. So again, the PowerPoint's gonna be shared, a survey's gonna get shared. So you're gonna, you're gonna have your hands on these resources. So, so Dr. Dr. Taylor, Megan, thank you so much for just like creating the presentation, bringing this forward, such an important uh, conversation buy a little bit more time here to see if we have any more questions. I do know like, the spotlight series that we're having, like I, I really enjoy this format. So just hearing the dialogue, the questions, the real time issues that, that we need to be talking about. So there will be future series that Talent 2025 will be bringing forward and, and Whitney and team did a great job pulling this all together. So thank you, Whitney, Alex, others. Um, I'm just looking forward to, to more of this in the in the future as well. So Tori in the chat, um, putting time into managers is very important um, mm -hmm. because they are key to employees or thoughts and how they are doing. Megan, Dr. <laughs> Taylor, any, any thoughts on that one? 
Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that that's, that's the, that's the next step. I mean, most people do a pretty good job of communicating. Um, so if you really want to get, get this out into your culture, um, I think your managers are the key. So spending some time with them and educating them and giving them the resources um, will probably help a lot. Yeah, I support and agree. I think the topic of mental health can get very personal and be perceived as very personal. And so that's where, you know, aligning with colleagues who feel closer to each other, I think can be mm -hmm. more effective than in uh, having the workplace feel more supportive around discussing this topic and being open to mm -hmm. um, any concerns people have for their mental health. I'll get, I want to thank, give a thank you to Lisa as well. I see that in the chat, Whitney. Don't want to forget that one. Lisa from Hope Network team helping us prepare this presentation too. Any, anything else? Any other questions? Uh, here we have their contact information. This will be shared as well. Love to see that. Uh, Whitney, anything else on your end as we kind of look to, to, to wrapping this up here? I just want to thank everyone for being here. Thank you to our partners at Hope Network, both Megan and Dr. Taylor. Thank you to our entire HR council. I know that a few of you are on the call and then others will watch the replay of this. Uh, just a reminder that the session has been recorded and you all will receive a follow-up email. So both everyone who attended today and then also everyone who registered. So you'll be able to replay the presentation at your convenience. You'll have a PDF version of this presentation. You'll also have the resource list that we shared. It's actually a two-page document. So I know some of you were excited about seeing that little snapshot. They presented two pages of information for you all. I just want to encourage you to take the survey so that we can continuously improve as we deliver events in the future. Um, and then, of course, just thank you all for being here. We hope that you found value in the session and we'll stay engaged with the work that we're doing. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone.